Okay, um, there is a midterm on Thursday, uh, Thursday night, and there was just ask, uh, what does it cover? It covers every all the material up until this, including this uh, lecture, but we won't talk about, or we won't ask questions about things that we will talk about on Wednesday, for example. Um, uh, the other announcement, which isn't written on here, but I'll write it right now, is the um, there are no labs this week except there are labs which are sort of midterm review type stuff. So there'll be uh, an old midterm that you can look at and, and uh, try to do in the lab. Um, any other questions about stuff? Okay, um, we're going to talk about binary search trees today, but before we talk about binary search trees, we have to talk about one further tree traversal, and that's uh, this tree traversal. It's called level order, and it works, as you can see, by, by first visiting all of the nodes at um, level 0, then at level 2, I mean 1, these should be 0, this is 0, this is 1. I don't know who wrote these slides, but in that order. So first, so the output of this level level order would be what? A. I've got to warm you up to the warm up because the warm up itself is kind of tricky. So A and then B. Oh hey, how convenient. D D. Somebody planned this. G H M I J. That's level order. First level, then next level, then next level, then next level. Yes. Should we always, uh, should we always um, mention the values from left to right? That's right. It's an order tree. For level order. Yeah. Okay. Everybody got it. What this thing is? This level order traversal. Okay, so you are now going to write the code to do level order traversal. That's what's right there. This big blank spot, that's your code. So uh, you can talk to your friend about it. You can try to figure out what you're supposed to, structures you might use. Um, I don't know, but you've got two and a half minutes to do this, okay? So code for level order traversal. Let me just tell you, my code is not recursive.
maybe 30 more seconds. Okay, um, let me ask big picture questions. Uh, for solving this problem, what sort of a structure would you like to use? What sort of an ordering type structure would you like to use? It's, you know, when, you, when you're doing recursion, recursion is basically a stack, right? When you call recursively a function, it stacks it up on a call stack. So this function, I don't know how to do it recursively. Maybe it sat me down to do it, but, um, but it's not recursive. It has a different sort of structure to it, an overall structure. What is that overall structure in which things are being handled in this particular case? Yeah. Like a queue. That's right. It's more like a queue than like a stack. But the question now is if you sort of think about this as being a queue, things are being pulled off of a queue, the question is what things are being put onto the queue. And you know, we can think about this as being kind of like if I started at the root, if I start at the root of the tree, then it's sort of like I'm exploring a haunted house, but I'm doing everything that's one step away first and then I'll do everything that's two steps away, and then I'll do everything that's three steps away. So the things that I'm going to be putting onto the queue or the nodes of the tree, the question is, how do I order that? How do I arrange that? So does somebody have a, well, let's start off. So this was a good idea. We're going to use a queue, queue, and the queue is going to be uh, a queue of node stars, so a node pointers, and we'll just call it queue because that's what it is. And we want to understand how the order in which we're putting things into that queue and taking things out of that queue so that we get the level order traversal that we want. But it's very much like this breadth first search type strategy we talked about for haunted houses. We, well, I'll tell you, we're going to start with the root, and we know that. But what are we going to do? Okay, I'll write it down. We're going to do this. And then you get to write the rest. So we in queue the root. Now what do we do? Yeah. I have to do something before I enqueue their children. I have to do something before I enqueue the root's children. What do I have to do? Um, I have to check that the root has children. I mean, I, you're right. I should check to make sure that they're not null, for example. But there's something even I have to do before that. Yeah? Uh, that's, yeah, sort of the same. I have to visit the node. Right. The whole point is we're visiting this in some sort of some sort of order, and so the first thing that I'm supposed to be doing is visiting this root node. So whatever process I'm going through and visiting, the first step is to visit something, and then after I visited it, I can decide to put its children into the queue as well. How should I organize that in this code? What should I do? I want to visit something, and then I want to put its children into the queue, and then I want to repeat, right? I mean, that's sort of the pattern. What should I do? Yeah. Oh, yeah, a while loop would be great. I could do while what? Not Q empty. And when it, while it's not empty, I'll take something out of it. Well, let's call it a pointer P. It's a pointer to a node. Q. 
dot dq I'm abbreviating dq and nq because I'm I don't have room that's why it's not because I'm lazy it's because I don't have room so I pull it out and then what do I do I visit it that's remember we have to visit so we have to see out this is our visit our visit is, is just printing out the data And then what do I do? So here I am, I'm at the root. I put the root into my queue. I pull, so this was in my queue. Here's my, here's my queue. Here's the front. And I put in A. I pulled it out. Now, what do I do? No, somebody, what? What do I do? Check for a left child if P arrow left, then what? By the way, I could say if P arrow left is not equal to null, which is what you should do, but I don't have enough room. So I'm just doing a P arrow left, which will also work because null is zero and zero is false in C. Isn't that cool? Don't ever do this. Not a good idea. So this is really P arrow left is not equal to null. Okay, so if it's not equal to null, then what? In it. Oops. Q dot in Q the left child. And then I suppose, so in this case it's not empty. B would go on here. And then we would want to get if P we'd want to pick up the right child. And in this case, also, there is a right child as well, C. And then what? Any more? Are you happy? Is this going to work? Could you prove it? If I gave you on some sort of future, close future exam, a question that said, prove the correctness of this level order traversal, you could come up with a, a loop invariant for this loop, and you could produce a proof of correctness, or at least you'd sort of have the structure in your head a little bit of how, of why this is working. Somehow, somehow we, we see that, that what's on the queue is the elements that we want to print out next in the order that we want them to be printed out. That's, that seems to be a good thing. What other properties of this loop invariant do you think are important to the correctness of this? Let me ask you a, 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 a question about it. Well, per, first of all, uh, if I looked at the queue, there are some things that have already been dequeued, and then there's the stuff that's in the queue, and then there's stuff that's going to be put in the queue. Just looking at the stuff that's in the queue, how many different levels are those things on? Just the stuff that's in the queue. Certainly here it's one. going to happen on the next while loop is we'll pull off the B. So the next thing we pull off is B. And then we'll in queue uh, D. And then we'll in queue E. So is it still one? 
This is at level, C is at level one, D is at level two, E is at level two. How many different levels are going to be in that queue? At most two? Not three? Now, there's nobody in this tree that has a pointer to a child that's more than one level below them. And so everybody that gets put into the queue from somebody who's at level i is going to have level i plus one. And until we finish all of the people that have level i, we're not going to get to anybody that has level i plus one. Because all the people that were at level i were put into the queue before we got to the people of level i plus one. Anyway, these seem to be all interesting pieces to some sort of correctness proof for this uh, level order traversal. But I, I really I really encourage you to sit down and try to figure out why this works. I mean, it's, it's not recursive, there's just a loop. And it's calling out for a loop invariant. And the question is, what can we say about that loop? What facts do we want to say about it? what the contents of a queue are as we work our way through this loop on every iteration. <laughs> Anybody have any questions about this? Uh, I would expect that this would be, this type of a problem would be one out of seven or six problems on a midterm exam, two-hour midterm exam, something like that. Just want to give you sort of my idea of timing. Any questions about level order traversal? This is the last type of traversal that we're going to talk about in class. We talked about pre-order traversal, post-order traversal, in-order traversal, ERP, SOC. We talked about lots of things. This is level order, which is not like those. It doesn't do recursion. It doesn't do a stack-based approach. It does a, a queue-based approach, like the difference between breadth-first and depth-first search. Okay. All right, I don't mean to scare you or anything like that, but I mean to scare you a little bit, just a little bit. Um, OK. Um, any other questions about this? Okay. We're going to talk about binary search trees. So this is a binary tree, but it has an additional property. And the reason we're talking about binary search trees is they're one way of implementing um, an abstract data type, which is called a dictionary. So the dictionary abstract data type, it's associating a key, like a keyword, with a definition or with some data. So you have a key data pair, sometimes called key value pairs. So for example, in this example, I have uh, uh, flavors of uh, operating systems. And there's uh, Multix, which was uh, an old, old Multix is unbelievable, actually. It pretty much has all of the features of every modern-day operating system, and it was built in the 70s or the 80s. It was crazy. Multix is one of them. Um, and Unix was a uniplexed version of Multix. And then there was the Berkeley software distribution of Unix, BSD Unix, which is what is running on your Mac, this BSD <coughs> Unix, with some bells and whistles. And then there's GNU, which is GNU is not Unix. That's what it's an acronym for GNU is not Unix. That's <laughs> the way it is. Um, 
And so these are examples of key value pairs. It's really like a dictionary. You want to look up something, you look up GNU by giving GNU. And uh, by the way, I don't think you pronounce GNU and GNU, but I am. So in any case, uh, you give it that GNU, and then you uh, find out from it what's the associated value to that key. In order to do this efficiently, using a binary search tree type thing. Typically, these keys are viewed as being orderable. That means there's some sort of ordering on them when I, I can compare them and I know which one is smaller than the other. The other thing that's interesting is, is that there's not two keys in the dictionary. There's no two unixes, there's one unix. And if there were two in there, it would be difficult for you to ask which one without specifying it somewhere. So dictionaries typically have a unique key. If there are multiple keys, then you might lose one of the definitions. You might always return one definition over, the, over, over some other. Okay, and then so the operations we want to we want to perform it, our, our find operations, that's when we look something up like find unix and it returns whatever, unix, uniplex, multics. Or you might want to insert some new stuff into that table, like for example, Linux comes along, which is minus Torvald's implementation of unix, and you can also plug that in there. And then there's, you know, like there's all these flavors of Linux, not there's like zillions of them. Um, that's basically just the wrapper around the operating system, uh, like Debian or Ubuntu or whatever. Um, you could insert all of those into our into our uh, dictionary here, so that you could look up all types of operating systems and tell people what they are. You can also remove stuff from the dictionary. There's this remove operation. Um, which is important when operating systems die, but operating systems really never die, so they're always there in their dictionary. But sometimes you have a dictionaries in which you want to remove things. Um, what other things do you know of in which in the world in which are structured like dictionaries? I have one more, which is something flight numbers which map to arrival time. Whenever you type into Air Canada's flight arrival scheduling thing to find out when the flight's coming in that you have to come to the airport and pick somebody up, it runs a dictionary. Look up. When is that flight coming? Look up the data for that flight and give it back to you. Anything else? I know, it's so hard to think of them. Okay, I got another one. That's a D. Domain names like google.com and IP addresses like 125.33.44. Whatever, whatever. There's, there's something out there called the domain name server. And when you type in a domain name into whatever on your browser uh, thing, Window? Bar, thank you. Bar. When you type the domain name into a bar, it doesn't know where that is. It goes and asks the domain name server. The domain name server looks up the name and it comes back with this number, which is this hierarchical tree like structured thing that tells the routers where to send the packets that you are going to be asking that website about and where the you know, it's going to start sending packets back to you because your IP address gets sent to them. Yeah. Yeah. Login. Your computer has to do this. Well, not, not really. Your computer has few passwords, so it could probably do that with a linear search. But, like, for example, 
the undergraduate servers here, they've got to handle everybody. So they, you type in a login name, and it has to look up what your password is so it can confirm that what you're doing, what you're typing in as your password is the correct password. Do you think those passwords are stored like passwords? Some file someplace? Just ask them. No, they're encrypted. Hmm, how are they encrypted? It's a very good question. You should really have a course on cryptography. Don't. Lobby your congressman. <laughs> um, anyway, very interesting because you can't keep passwords lying around because everybody's breaking into machines all the time because nobody can write a secure machine because they're complicated. Any other examples? I mean, it's like there's so many in the world for dictionaries. Dictionaries are one of the most prevalent data structures in computers. They're all over the place. And so there are a lot of data structures to support dictionaries of different types, and we will talk about several of them. The first one that we're going to talk about, though, is binary search trees. And before we do that, though, we have to talk about how we might implement dictionaries right now with the data structures that we know. So we know coin quests, we know unsorted arrays, and we know sorted arrays. So you remember dictionaries have an orderable key, so the keys are orderable, we could sort them. They have associated with the key a bit of data, and we are given as input when we want to find something, we are given the key and we want to retrieve the data. Okay. How much time does it take, in the worst case, to perform these operations on our different uh, data structures that we know? What's the worst case time to perform insert on a linked list? Order n? You mean big O of n? I agree with that. It's also big O of n squared. Is it big omega of n? How much time does it take to insert into a linked list? Do you remember linked lists? What did you have to do to insert into a linked list? Okay, let me give you a key piece of advice. You can insert it anywhere. Just has to be inserted. How much time does it take? Ooh, that's a big difference. Insert. Theta of one. How do you do it? Yeah. Which pointers? Just change the pointers, but which ones? Where would you put it in your linked list? You'd put it at the end. So at the end meaning the tail of the linked list. I mean, it's okay. That means you have sort of have a tail pointer at the end, and you insert it at the end, you put on another tail pointer. Sure. Or you can put it at the head, that's right. You can make it a circular linked list, and then it wouldn't point to everybody. Or you can make a doubly linked list, and you can point either way. It's it's sort of up to you. But in any case, there's order one time in a linked list, a singly linked list. Order one time, you can put it at the beginning, you can put it at the end. Depends on what access pointer you have to your list. Uh, typically, you have a head pointer, and typically it's put at the front just because it's easy. And you don't have to keep a tail pointer. But who cares? It's order one time. How much time does it take, though, to find now in your linked list where the head pointer? I want to look up your password using your username. How much time is that going to take? Big O of N? Is it big omega of N? N, we're assuming here, is number of students. Now I'm starting to worry. Uh, yeah? It's big O of N because you have to three times yeah, we're talking here about worst case time. 
In the worst case, they will ask for somebody who is not in your list. They will traverse the entire list looking for this person, and it will say that person does not exist. Yeah. What is the correct location? Do you have an idea of how you want to arrange your links list? You want to order it by key? You want to sort it? Sorted link list? Yeah, I'm not sure whether the link list is sorted. Sorted well, I guess in this case, it might be sorted. I, I, you can either have it sorted or you can have it not sorted. I'm, I'm always just thinking of it as being a linked list full of stuff. And it doesn't matter. It's all. It doesn't matter what order it comes in. I just put it on to the front, and I get order one time. Oh, is that how like all the notes have to be placed in like some sort of order? Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, so, so because I think that is of the order n. Uh, find is order n. Oh, but for insert. Oh, if, if you want to insert in a particular location? Yeah. Yeah. No order n. If you want to insert it in a sorted linked list. Also, in this case, insert is order is big O one because you know, we don't really care about the order in which the nodes. That's right. We just want to get it into the linked list, and everybody's happy. How much time does it take to remove a node after you find it? Well, it depends on if you've been clever. If you've been clever, you've kept the previous pointer, and you just route the previous pointer around the thing that you found. If you're even more clever, you have a deadhead at the beginning, and you can not worry about somebody erasing the deadhead, so you can actually do that even if it's the first thing in the, in the array. So I think it's going to be something like data one. You can get it after you find. This is after you found the node. You can remove it in constant time if you kept a bit of stuff, just meaning a pointer to the thing. The, pre, the, preview, the predecessor node you need that pointer because you have to route its next pointer around the next node. All right, it looks like this. I've got to get this guy to go around. Okay. Uh, how about an unsorted array? So now it's an array. There are no pointers, just indices. And it's unsorted. So how much time does it take to insert into an unsorted array? Your new pair, which is a key value, key definition, key data. How much time does it take to insert into an array? Data of one. Yeah. But occasionally you might have to resize. But we know how to handle these things. Yep. You are picking a position where we're inserting. What position would you ins you want to insert in the first position? Is that where you want to put it? Well, I thought like if you wanted to insert like in the middle of the you want to insert in the middle? Maybe we should just jump directly to the sorted array. That will make all of your questions accurate. <laughs> if you wanted to insert into a sorted array and you wanted to insert something that was in the middle, then you would have to shift things over. Definitely true. But if you're inserting, inserting into an unsorted array, oh. 
I don't care where you put it. It's unsorted, which means you can put it at the end and increment the length of the array by one, which is what I would do. I mean, you could put it at the front, but then you'd have to shift everything down. You could put it in the middle if you want, but then you'd have to shift half of it around. I think I would put it at the end and shift nothing and spend constant time, except for resize, which we know how to handle. So it's sort of amortized, or amortized. Okay, how much time is fined in an unsorted array? Well, it's unsorted, so it could be anywhere. So we better check everywhere, which means it takes data and time. I mean, these order one things are awesome. That's really the best that you could possibly hope for in your dictionary. But this data of n stuff, it's miserable. It takes forever to perform these find operations, which is not maybe what you want. I mean, even if you think about it, a dictionary, you, how many times do you add a new word to a dictionary? It's like, it happens a few times a year, but not like the number of times that people look stuff up. If they look it up in the boring in dictionaries. But anyway, they, they, they're going to perform the operations find a lot more than they're going to perform the operations insert or delete. So you want that to be fast. How much time does it take to remove after you found something? I check and look in the array. And here it is, right here in the middle. After remove it. Yay. How much time? One? It's done? There's a big hole in the middle. Now you want me to shift stuff. Yeah. Take the last thing put it there. Yeah, it's unsorted. So I'll just take the thing at the end and put it in the middle. So it's still order one. I pull something out of the middle of the array, then I'll just so I'll, I'll just write this with a swap uh, to end. So another way to do it is you could swap it to the end and then take it off the end. So you find it, swap it to the end, and take it off the end. Uh, okay, great. Sorted arrays. How much time does it take to insert into a sorted array? It's a sorted array. How much time does it take to insert into a sorted array? Right <coughs> hand? Why? Yeah. Right, you have to find where it goes, and when you find where it goes, you got to put it there. And then, what are you supposed to do with everybody that's following? You have to sort of shove them down, right? So there are n things that have to move, and there's no real flexibility in an array to make you do that, allow you to do that, so it really takes a long time. Theta, whoops. It really takes a long time, something like theta of n, to do the insertion into a sorted array. How much time does it take, though, to do the find operation? If I want to find something, I give you the key. How much time does it take to find it in a sorted array? One? Really? I don't know how to do it in order one time. Huh. If I know the index, but I only know the key, so I only know the word Unix, and I want to know what the definition of Unix is. And now what do I do? Login. How can you do it in login time? Yeah. Keep bisecting the array until you find the unless the fewest number of words. But but uh, you have to actually do a comparison. So you have to compare against the middle element. And if it's smaller than the middle element, you look in the left part of the array. If it's bigger than the middle element, you look at the right part of the array. I blame the lack of dictionaries in people's lives for their 
Now, if you have a big, huge, gigantic dictionary, and you're told you have to look up a word, you understand binary search immediately. It's almost impossible not to use binary search for a really big dictionary book like this. Anyway, so you can do it by binary search. Just pick the middle, compare. If it's smaller, go to the left. If it's larger, go to the right. It's data of log n time, which is great. This is good. Um, I mean, it's not order one, but it's not very big. It's small. Very, very. So this is good. This is bad. And how much time does it take to remove after you find something from a sorted array? Again, it's this linear structure, and you can't leave holes, or else you ruin your running time in the future. So you pull something out, you leave a hole, it's got to be closed up. You've got to move that stuff back in sorted order. You can't do your trick of pulling off the end and plugging in the middle, or else you ruin the sorted order. So we're stuck here with data of n time. This is bad as well. So we're, well, you know, what's good in here is the log n. The log n is good. The order one is, of course, really good. We'll see data structures that will give you order one lookup time, and will give you order one insert time, and we'll, but eventually we'll get to those. But right now we're looking at something that's better than linear in some measure, right? Like all of these things in their worst measure, insert, find, or remove, they're linear. So we have to fix that. Yeah? So like uh, for insert, uh, for sorted array, is that actually like, is it like log n and plus n? Because like you have to find the uh, location for like insert. Yeah. So would I write down theta of log n plus n? Uh, yeah, I know this is still 10, but it's just like... Okay. Yeah. But it doesn't matter. Yeah. I could even do a linear search. It's still theta of n. In fact, you don't have any of those. So the, the comment here was that if I insert into a sorted array, why am I not paying log n plus n? But then it was realized that log n plus n is still theta of n. So why would I even bother doing the search using a binary search to find the place where I need to insert the element? Why would I even bother doing that? Because I might as well just use linear scan. Probably would be faster. <coughs> don't have the overhead. But maybe not. Who knows? Actually, it would probably be faster to do the log n search. Any other questions about this? Okay. Uh, so you, this is what we just talked about, binary search. Binary search is a way to figure out in a sorted array where your, uh, where your key is. And so these are keys, these numbers 2 through 25, those are keys. And I'm not showing you the data because I'm lazy. And I give you a key, and you're supposed to find it. And the way that binary search works is it says, find the middle element and check if the key is smaller than the middle element or larger than the middle element. And if it's smaller, then go to the left and repeat recursively. That's going this way. Or if it's larger, go to the right and repeat recursively. Or you're lucky and you found it. And you stop. And you're done. Now the interesting thing about this is that we understand just from the structure of the array what elements will be compared based on the outcomes of the previous comparisons at every step. Right? If I make a comparison against the middle, and I know I'm going to be comparing against the middle, that element number 9, if I make that comparison and I know what the outcome is, less than, then I know where I'm going to compare next. It's 5, the middle of what's happening before, the middle of the array that's before. So this structure that I've drawn here, there's two branches. For an array of size n, it's fixed. So that's kind of interesting. It means that I could, and, and what's the other feature? The other feature is that every node 
in this array shows up as a comparator at some point, right? It might be way down at the leaf, like number 25 down here is down stuck at a leaf, but every node in the array shows up and every element in the array shows up as a node of this tree, this binary tree. The, the bad parts about the sorted array for the uh, dictionary implementation, the bad parts were its inflexibility to insertions and deletions. We had to contract the whole array when we removed something. We had to pry apart a spa space for a new element when we wanted to insert something. But if I look at this tree-like structure, all of a sudden I start thinking, hey, I've got a little bit more flexibility. This tree-like structure is the binary search tree. I've truncated the binary search tree in this case, but it's the same thing as what's on the picture before. It's a binary tree, and it's essentially giving you the blueprint for binary search in an array, but it's doing it in a tree. And because it's in a tree, we can insert new things into it much more easily than we could into an array. Because we just go and add something, add another child to some node in the tree in the appropriate place, of course. So the binary search tree has two properties. First, it's a binary tree. Every node has, at most, two children. And then the second part is the search tree property. And the search tree property reflects the fact that it's, it's trying to be acting for a dictionary, and we need to be able to look up keys in it. And the efficient way of doing that is to say, when you're comparing against a node, all of the items in the left subtree are less than that node's value. So all of the items in this subtree, for example, the one with five at the top, those are all smaller than nine. And all the ones in this subtree are larger than nine. And this is true at every node in the tree. It's the recursive property that holds everywhere. Is it okay? You understand these are binary search trees. Probably knew this already. What you may not know is what are these numbers and names that are stuck over here in this tree? Anybody got a guess? Coco? Curry? These are the top cat names in Japan, <laughs> and that number is their rank. So Kuto is a very popular cat name in Japan. I think it means black. Is that correct? Anybody know? No? Anyway, you know better than I do, because I don't know Japanese. But I do know cat names now. And these are great names because they're short. I can write them right below the node and they don't get confused. Plus, they're kind of fun. You might think about like naming your cat something like Rin. OK, um, any questions about the definition of binary search tree? This is the abstract data type implementation, again, it's a dictionary. It has public stuff, which is the constructors, the insert, the remove, the find operation. All of those are in here. Insert, remove, find. They're all public. The stuff that's private is the actual implementation as a search tree, a binary search tree. And that's captured in a node structure, which carries now both key and data, and also has, uh, again, like a binary tree, left and right uh, child pointers. OK, next time we will talk about uh, implementation details for the binary search tree and um, 
and we'll, we'll talk about improvements as well.